Lola Donna, can you introduce yourself? My name is LaDonna Brave Bull Ellard. My real name is Tamakawa Shtewi. I am an enrolled member of the Stani Rock Sioux Tribe. I am Ihunktua, Pabiska, and Sisitan Dakota. I am Hunkpapa, Sihasapa, and Oguala Lakota. And I am from the Cannonball River. And what do you do in your normal life? Uh, what's your daily routine like? So, my life and my tribe is I am the tribal historian and tribal genealogist. Mm -hmm. And so I compile history of my tribe and my people and put all the family together, who's related, how they're related, because in our culture we have a lot of cultural rules on relationships. And so that is what I've done for about 35, 37 years now. And how far are you able to trace your genealogy? Or like the family trees goes back to how long? I, I only can trace till 1600. 1600. Because everything, our, our lives are oral. And so if your family did not keep the oral history, it's gone. But ours, we have a, a cutoff goes back to a great massacre where we lost the majority of our people and that's where we cut off. Mm -hmm. After the massacre, the remnants of the people who survived created families again. Mm -hmm. So I can only go to the massacre. Rana, you've been a very, very uh, important part of the Standing Rock movement and for good reason it became an inspiring movement across the world it was one of those which awakened i think a lot of people who normally don't look at such movements and to the fact that there are there's the global south even in north america um, so can you describe how that happened how your own personal inspiration and a little bit about the movement so when the Stani rock sioux tribe was faced with the ideal of of this pipeline it was not about anti-oil or anti-pipeline it was about the protection of the water mm -hmm. we still have our tribal ways and our tribal beliefs so when we cross the water we pray for the water we have a connection to the water the water is a living being the water is the first medicine of the world and so we have these 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 cultural ways and then all of a sudden somebody is going to come in the middle of our culture and divide it. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, a little more for us. Um, I worked for the Tribal Historic Preservation Office and my job was to protect sacred sites, burial sites, traditional cultural properties, village sites from desecration. And this project was going to destroy all of them. And so we started by talking to our community. And we went to the schools and we talked to the kids. We started the first project of asking all the kids, what do you think of the water? Mm. From kindergarten on up, the kids wrote about what they thought about water. And basically what they told us, water is life. So then that became our cry, mm. came from the kids. And then um, as we were educating our community about the possibilities of them building this and what could happen to us and the loss of our water. A woman, Joy Brown, had come with these young people and they said, why don't you start a camp? And everybody in the room, nobody said anything. No, none of our tribal leaders, they were all talking about possibilities, but nobody said yes. So at the end of the meeting, I got up and said, I have land. You can start a camp on my land. Mm -hmm. And so on April 1st, we started Sacred Stone Camp, not understanding what we were doing. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a grandiose plan. We just knew that we had to stand up for the water. How we did that, we did not know. So we went to our elders and we said, how do we do this? And they said, pray. Mm -hmm. So we went to ceremony and we, we went to our prayers, we blessed the water, and we started. <laughs> I had no idea what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that the world would hear us. And so as we, as we started, 
It was the young people who started it. The young people who decided, how do we help? And they couldn't figure out what to do. So they put their feet on the ground and they ran. Mm -hmm. And they ran and they prayed. And first they ran to the meeting that we were having. Then they ran to Omaha, which is about a thousand miles to deliver the message to the federal agency. Then when they came back, they said, we will wa run to Washington, D.C. to tell the president what we think. So the kids ran across country. Oh. And then they came home. And as they ran, people are saying, what are you doing out here? And they would send the message to everyone. We are fighting for our water. And as we were standing up, we were training our people. How do you stand in peace? How do you stand in nonviolent resistance? How do you stand in ceremony? How do you de-escalate situations? So we were doing these trainings all the time at, at camp. How do we stay nonviolent? And one of the things that we learned, how powerful non-violent resistance is and but as the kids came back more and more people started coming and so we said what do we do so we went back to ceremony with our elders and they said there is nothing we can do the world is listening our ancestors stand with us this is the way it's supposed to be you walk in prophecy now so as, as things progressed in September, on September 3rd, when the people were watching them dig up our burial sites and they were crying, they sent dogs on us. And when they did that, the world seemed and more people came. So 100,000 people came to stand with us, 25,000 people on the ground living in the camp. On the average, we created a city, but what do you do with a city mm. without infrastructure? Mm. So we created a school for the kids. We created uh, eco bathrooms, eco showers, People brought in solar. They brought in uh, earth-friendly houses so that we can live. We put up our traditional homes. And then we started holding classes on how do you live on our land, in our environment. We have a harsh environment. And then we started telling story. And everywhere you walk, there were people praying. There were people singing. There were people dancing. And I remember walking around along my river and there were people all along the river praying. And one of the things that happened was people from around the world brought their water from their rivers, their ponds, their oceans to put in our river. So every day there were prayer ceremonies as we put this water and brought this water from the world mm -hmm. into the river. I think that was the key to touching the world. I tell people, to my own eyes, what I witness myself, just me. I was the honor to be in 17 different prayer ceremonies in one day, every day, listening to different languages, and cultures, and people, every day. So, I remember that people used to ask me all kinds of crazy things at camp. So this man came up and said, we came here in a good way. We brought food. Me and my wife cooked. We want you to know if it is all right and are we are welcome. And I said, yes, everybody's welcome. He said, because we are Hindu and we brought you Hindu food. And his wife cooked for all the people. And one day there was a man standing on the hill. They said, he won't come down. He wants you to go talk to him. So I went up there and he said, I brought my five children. 
we want to stand with you. I said, okay. He said, no, you don't understand. Am I welcome? Well, why wouldn't you? I am Muslim. Are Muslims welcome? Yes, everybody is welcome. There were two men that came from Africa to come and pray. Are we welcome? Yes, you are welcome. So what I seen there at Standing Rock was not about us. It was about the world. It was about this global movement. It was about something greater than any of us. And even though things, the army came for us and the militia groups and the police, we understand that. But I think it was like, this is how it was supposed to be. To create seeds to spread across the world. To say that if you stand up, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, you can make change. I tell people, we must empower ourselves. We must feed ourselves. Feeding ourselves is the first act of sovereignty. We must protect our water because water gives us life in every living thing. To me, those are the major components of what we need to spread across the world. Thank you so much for that. Um, after Standing Rock, are there other similar movements that you've had to be part of or which you have been privileged to be, to have been associated with? So for me, there's never been after Standing Rock. <laughs> So when the camps were closed, all the people moved to my home and my daughter's home. I think my daughter had two, three hundred people. I had about 80 in my home. And so we created what we call Sacred Stone Camp that now exists. And so what do you do? First thing that I seen that was needed was people needed to heal. Hmm. From wherever they came from, they needed to heal. Second, they needed purpose. We planted gardens. Then we planted trees. Then we did river cleanups. We cleaned up our river. We go down there all the time just to pick up garbage and clean the rivers. We um, started a media campaign to educate our young people on how to share their own story, to tell their own, to be able to produce it, edit, it belongs to them so that we can let the world know who we are. We started a program of feeding elders. We have a temporary homeless uh, place for people who are homeless that they can come and stay a short time and go. The camp is open to anybody who wants to come. They can stay two days, three days, some never leave. Um, to come, we do storytelling, we do food preservation, we do seed saving, how do you prepare for whatever is coming in this world? And so the, the men who live there, they noticed that one of the things we don't have on my reservation was a fire department. So they all went to training and they're now the first volunteer fire department for my people. The second thing they're doing is they're all doing training for hazmat cleanup because the day will come when we have to clean up the mess they leave us. And we established uh, the Mongolian people of northern China have become our great friends and allies. So when we started camp, they sent us these girts, girts, and so we have them up as homes for people to come stay in, along with our traditional lounging that people can come and stay. Mm. Everybody who comes must work. You must work on healing. And you must work in our community. Mm. I, I will say bad things. We need people to be allies and not saviors. We don't need anybody to save us. Mm. We need additional hands mm. to work with us. Mm. And so our camp 
and the other thing that they have just finished is how to install solar panels and solar energy. We just established a solar farm that is for 1,200 people and the whole community will be on solar. But what good is that if you're going to hire outside people to build it? So mm. then we set up training so our own people can learn to build them and put them up themselves. So in effect, you're, uh, there's a lot of movements that move from resistance to creating alternatives, uh, which is both, I guess, reasserting what's from the past, but also new things like solar. So y y that's the kind of trajectory that the movement is going through. So that is what, but we are still standing. Mm. We are still, right now we have filed additional lawsuits against the oil company. Uh, just this last week, in fact, uh, we are still doing nonviolent resistance. One of the things that we learned from Standing Rock is all of these movements that are happening, we go and stand with them. Mm -hmm. So in Mauna Kea, where the Hawaiians are standing up to protect the sacred mountain, we stand with them. In New Zealand, where they're protecting their land from a housing development, we stand with them. Mm. With the Aboriginals in Australia fighting a cold mine, we stand with them. Mm. So what has happened since then is we've been networking. Mm. We send each other a prayer, a message, I got your back, I'm standing with you. Mm are we physically can send people to go stand with them. It depends, each, each movement is different in their needs. Yeah. And so I have learned that you cannot just go. Uh -huh. You have to see what their needs are. And so as we watch everywhere, right now in the world, people are standing up. Whatever their issues, they are standing up. Yeah. My dream is that we all talk to each other. Mm -hmm. We all communicate and we all support each other because the end result is just a better world. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. Just a better world to save what we have, to preserve what we have, not to get involved in anybody's cultural ways, our, our languages, our traditions or anything, just to stand together. That's what I learned when the people came to Standing Rock. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your words and all the work. It's extremely inspiring. Thank you. Well, you know what's happening on my land now. Since the people left from the camp, because, you know, I, I had illusions. I had one time thought human beings were the worst thing for the world. And now I do not think that. After the camps and all the people went away, my land exploded with medicines and plants that hadn't been there for years. Mm -hmm. These compost piles that they made had squash and melons and things growing all in the middle of this area. We carried out three truckloads to give to the community. Mm -hmm. And the wildlife is all back. Mm -hmm. And the medicines that we collect are all back. So I realized man has purpose on this earth. He has to just live here in respect. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So